So, Christian responsibility. This all got started when I had some comments, negative comments made toward me by a therapist, and he represents the world. He certainly didn't represent Christianity. When you get to the point of what you perceive is true for you, don't make waves, right? If this is what you perceive is true, then I shouldn't argue. Really? Really? Well, it could, it could work uh, not threatening to me, or it could be threatening too. I perceive you're a danger and I have a right to kill you. Really? No, I'm going to argue perceptions based on evidence, not on what you think is true. Especially if it affects me, and it affects you as a Christian, I have a uh, duty to address the issue if, it, if the thought is brought up. The perception rule it is often stated that an individual and in what he or she says and does is responsible for how others perceive those words and deeds. One rule in business and largely in the world today is that if what you say or do is perceived as offensive to another, then you are responsible for causing an offense, no matter how appropriate your words and delivery, no matter how, if you are directed to respond to a question or just happen to be overheard in the hallway. That's happened to me so many times. I don't know how many people I've had get angry with me and because they don't like my vocal cords. See here right now? I'm not yelling. This is my voice. I'm a man. I'm nearly 80. I've sold equipment for decades. I have a little bit louder voice than, than uh, some people. So don't take offense. <clears throat> what you want me to go? Go to my doctor and have my vocal cords changed to suit you? My accent, same thing. <clears throat> have my, uh, give, give me a new pharynx or larynx, whatever it is, and develop a California accent because the one I have from the East Coast is no good. Really? <clears throat> so, reality says that the perception of the human mind is at best faulty. At best. <clears throat> so in light of this, wouldn't the perception will make one responsible for another person's another's perception, even if it's completely wrong? Would an individual therefore be subject to discipline for another's lack of ability to understand the meanings of certain words which were expressed or for mishearing what was said? That's your perception. I didn't say that. <clears throat> you know, you can't go before the judge and you're somebody's accused of committing a crime and one guy said, well, that's what I heard. So the judge says, well, I'll have to go with what he, what he heard. But witnesses say, no, that's not what was said. Here it is in writing. Doesn't matter. The guy that thinks he's offended, he gets the rule. Really? One's perception of another's actions must be stored in one's memory and then recalled. But this perception and memory is flawed at best as well. Psycho heresy awareness letter. Some people would have us think that the memory is like a tape recorder that records every event accurately and keeps it intact. But memory, research and memory has debunked that myth. Memories are created out of images, overheard conversations, dreams, suggestions, and imaginations, as well as of actual events. Sometimes bad memory. <clears throat> and they change over time. Sometimes you have an agenda. Even as we remember, we tend to fill in the gaps. Therefore, each time a memory is recalled, it is also recreated with the emotions accompanying the recall and with the imagination which fills the gaps. Even immediate recall may be inaccurate simply because of an initial failure to perceive accurately. <clears throat> that is why those who testify about a particular event may give completely different stories. Memories are also very malleable. They change even as we recall past events. <clears throat> even under the best circumstances, our memory is incomplete. We creatively fill in details with probabilities. Furthermore, the absurdity of the perception rule is established when it is realized that being offended by anyone might cause the offender to also be offended. Thus, both individuals by this human viewpoint rule are responsible for the other's perception. Which one is right? God says neither party is to take offense in the first place. Proverbs 17, 9 and 19, 11. I got occur, accused of doing something that was offensive to somebody else, and it had nothing to do with them. It's a conversation that they misread and misoverheard that I was having with somebody else. And so the lady said, well, you still have to honor that person's offense because she took offense at what you said. 
Well, I said to the lady, my boss, I said, well, I'm offended that they're offended. Now what do you do? She looked at me and puzzled and then walked away. An actual case involving the perception rule was experienced by the writer at work when the writer, perceiving abusive and uncooperative behavior, reported these actions toward himself, including withholding information needed for him to do his job. The managers responded for a long while by doing nothing. Considering that someone was having a bad day and someone else was overreacting. That was me. Was I? But when the abuse and refusal to provide information continued and was confirmed by others, management stated that it perceived that the writer must have done something which has triggered this behavior in the other individual. So I'm still at fault. This, thus, management was arbitrarily making the writer responsible for the abusive behavior toward himself by using the perception rule. That's how management perceived the situation, so that's how it was. In effect, the abuse of individuals' unwarranted and vituperative behavior toward the writer was permitted by the use of the perception rule. It was perceived as justified even with, when withholding information by the abusive individual continually caused a disruption in the workflow. This behavior was perceived as being caused by the writer somehow, and the continued abusive behavior resulted in the writer leaving that employment. Another case of wronger, wrongful perception involving the writer occurred at work, which resulted in wrongful ter determination for being insubordinate. The supervisor perceived insubordination that was non-existent. The writer was determined by outside authority of an investigation to have been required to perform beyond human capabilities, and then wrongly terminated for insubordination for not being able to follow impossible instructions. So the perception rule was used again, as it usually is, to, to manipulate and control others, even to the extent of getting rid of unliked individuals, thus enhancing one's own position. This is often done by pushing another into unchristian-like ways until he responds, and then the perception of insubordination or negative behavior can be claimed and the party forced or terminated from their position. Incidentally, the perception rule does not permit the person being accused of any defense whatsoever. He is guilty no matter what nor is the accuser's perception ever questioned. In effect, what, whatever the accuser decides to perceive <clears throat> in his own mind becomes absolute truth, therefore deifying his own mind for that moment as absolutely perfect and true like the mind of God. An interesting flaw that becomes apparent with this reasoning. <clears throat> Suppose one perceives that, one, that the accuser's perception is in error. Now then, which perception does authority choose to select as absolutely true? Little consideration is given to an analysis of the facts of the situation. Employers often bring up the issue of multi-million dollar lawsuits involving the perception of being offended at the workplace as if to say that a faithful believer's lifestyle is a potential risk of high, high dollar loss. The fact of the matter is that there are no dollar losses through lawsuits due to a faithful believer's lifestyle at all. But if there were multi-million dollar lawsuit losses incurred by a company because of a believer's faithful walk with Christ, then who is that individual to continue to obey, the company or the Lord Jesus Christ? In other words, who is sovereign over the lives of people, God or IBM? It is interesting to note that most of the world's religions and philosophies teach forgiveness and not taking offense, turning the other cheek, especially in um, Asian countries. More importantly, God's word commands one not to take offense and to forgive one another. So take a look at Proverbs 79. He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Proverbs 19.11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Matthew 18.21-22. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times 7, i.e. there's no limit on the number of times. Many people consistently violate their own rule of not being offensive to others by ostracizing, ignoring, speaking ill about, and even insulting others whom they dislike. It is interesting to note that when a faithful Christian perceives obstructive and offensive behavior on the part of others and reports it as interfering with him doing his job, like it happened to me, Management often determines that the Christian's perception is not valid and he is a person who does not work well with others. <clears throat> he does not fit in. He is not a team player. Because obstructive and offensive behavior toward the faithful believer is frequently and rarely investigated, management 
concludes that the cause of the neg negative behavior must somehow originate with the Christian. The manager usually associates the cause of the situation to some religious talk that the Christian must have made. On the other hand, if an unbeliever or unfaithful Christian perceives the same offensive obstructive behavior coming from another, that perception is usually determined without investigation as valid, and steps are taken to resolve the situation. Even, especially if a believer, a faithful believer, is perceived as the originator of the offensive behavior. The writer has personally experienced and observed this phenomenon at the workplace time and time again. Now, I remember when I was working on kind of a, a very small half-circle table. Three or four people at this table were shoulder to shoulder, and this one woman, she has her speaker uh, earphones on, and she's singing, singing at the, loud, uh, the loudest her voice could be, screaming, and I'm sitting there, Right next to her, my finger could touch her keyboard, and uh, she's screaming. I said, could you keep it down? I, I can't concentrate. And uh, and uh, w the manager said, let her do her thing. She's doing fine. I said, but she's screaming, and everybody else in the office is offended too. Well, the problem was, I said, well, I, I, it's time for me to go then. I can't do my work if somebody's screaming at the top of their lungs. I don't care if they are singing hymns from from the from a Christian uh, hymn, hymn book. Um, so that was weird. Being closed-minded is wrong. I, I'm closed-minded about getting enough air to breathe. I think I should have air to breathe. The world holds that being narrow-minded is wrong, prejudicial. People often use the following expression in defending today's liberal and permissive mentality. We're in the 90s, in the 2000s now, as if to say that closed-mindedness is the sin and not sin itself. Can one not be closed-minded about not committing a particular sin before God? I don't think somebody should. I, I'm closed-minded about being shot, you know. Bullets, they hurt. God himself is closed-minded when it comes to what is sin and what is not. And he is absolutely closed-minded about the way to go to heaven. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, that's pretty closed-minded. Which is by faith alone in Christ alone, 1 John 5, 9-13. And God indeed is a God of justice who is narrow-minded about sin. Look at Psalm 11. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur, sulfur a searching wind, and will not be their lot. For the Lord is righteous, he loves justice, upright men will see his face. Proverbs 11.21 Be sure of this, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will go free. Finally, if narrow-mindedness is a sin, then those who are narrow-minded about Christians and their Bible, considering them wrong, commit such a sin. Incidentally, everyone is closed-minded about some things. I'm closed-minded about breathing every day, eating somebody else's closed-mindedness, their own belief system. So the question is not whether or not narrow-mindedness is wrong, but what to be narrow-minded about. Others are responsible for your feelings. That's close, close to the last one. Most of the world maintains that the actions and words of others are what is responsible for the way people feel. One often says to another, you make me angry. Bringing on a bad mood, being in a bad mood gives one the latitude of warning others not to take their mood, make their mood worse and to treat them with a certain latitude of special respect and caution so as not to cause them to erupt in unpleasant outrage. Scripture maintains that one is not to take offense so one cannot blame another for how one feels. Furthermore, God's word provides guidelines for Christians' behavior in the workplace. Romans 12, 9 to 21. Love must be sincere, agape love, self-sacrificial love. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another, another above yourselves. <clears throat> Interesting. This, these other things we've been going over is kind of self-centered stuff. I'm right and you're always wrong. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. So do not be conceited. Do not repay another evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
For it is written, it is mine to revenge, I will repay, says the Lord. 